And uh, if you're interested in that, please call Danette. Don't see Danette. Call Danette and uh, let her know. I think they usually like to have about six, eight people. And I know that there's some people that signed up on the uh, sheet out there. So if you're planning on being there, please make sure that you contact her, connect with her some way so that she knows how many she's got. Make sure she doesn't have too many. Uh, Man, that was easy. All right. Let's go to the prayer list. All right. I'm trying to see if there's any on here that I can update you on. Um, Edwin uh, Link, they, they've decided to do injections rather than surgery for him. So continue to remember him. Um, <coughs> just going through the list. Ronnie's still dealing with flu? Ronnie's better. We can take Ronnie off. Praise the Lord for that. Riley and Amaru have both been dealing with some stuff. Um, I think it's Riley's been had to take some some sort of injections uh, to help her, some antibiotic injections to help her. Her sickness was that bad. So remember her. Uh, Gabby Lohman, um, they've uh, been trying to do some infusions but not been able to get good veins. And so they're uh, trying to decide when and where they're going to put a port in so that they can start giving her her medicine that way. Um, She's a young lady. She's she's on what, 19 or 20, Trace? Gabby? She's about 19 or 20. But uh, she's been dealing with some sickness for a while. Uh, Stephanie and Josh are both sick tonight, so please remember them. And uh, Nicole. Linnell. Oh, okay. He's also doing double pneumonia. And uh, Susan, uh, is this about the nose issues she's been, the swelling? Okay. She's dealing with some swelling uh, from, from, I guess, from that procedure she had. So remember her, if you will. I think God will touch her and minister her. All right. Wow. Okay. He's there rehab. Okay. Right. I got you. Okay. Remember, remember that situation. Remember those at the nurse at the nursing home and the rehab center that are dealing with all this flu. We'll take it. Hey. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hey, you had me from the word go. <laughs> you took off. I was like, yes, Lord, go ahead. Bless her. Amen. Bless me. Praise the Lord. Well, it's 2018, folks, if you ain't figured it out. I don't know what you're, I don't, I don't know if anybody's still writing 17, but I'm glad that you can take a 7 and make it an 8 pretty easy if you just squiggle a little bit more. So, uh, but uh, we're going to get started in our scriptures tonight. We're going to be looking at the uh, epistle to Ephesus. Um, uh, in Revelation chapter 2. And so uh, if you want to grab your Bibles and turn there. But before we do, let's uh, pray. Ask God to minister these needs and requests. And uh, we've got uh, several folks that are still dealing with some sickness and stuff. Is Roger? Praise God. All right. Thank the Lord for that. So uh, uh, continue to pray uh, for my dad, if you will. Uh, he spent New Year's Day in the hospital. And uh, he got out uh, yesterday. He was supposed to have surgery on a torn meniscus in his knee today, but because his heart uh, went into AFib and they had to try to straighten his heart out, they want him to see his cardiologist before they put him to sleep to work on his knee. And so uh, remember my dad, if you will, uh, that God would touch him and minister him. Uh, also, uh, Tracy's dad, continue to remember Jerry, uh, as he's um, trying to work through this process of figuring out what they're going to do with his medicine and how they're going to go about this kidney. We're just believing God to heal him, make him whole, that he don't have to have the surgery. And uh, we're trusting God for that. All right. Y'all quiet books tonight. You all right? Getting over the New Year's blues or something? I don't know what's going on here. Y'all party too hard New Year's Eve after I left y'all here at church or something? Praise the Lord. God's good. Amen. Amen. If you would, let's stand. And we're going to pray. And then we're going to jump right into Revelation chapter 2. <coughs> And uh, just believe him for the Lord to have his way. So if uh, you will, let's pray together. Father, we love you so much. Thank you again for the opportunity that you've given us to come to your house, the opportunity to call upon your name. I just pray tonight, God, that you would move and minister 
and every need and request that's been mentioned. We thank you for the praise reports. Thank you for touching Paula. Thank you for touching Ronnie, and thank you for touching Roger. We thank you, Father, for doing the healing in their bodies, God, and what you're going to continue to do in their lives, God. We praise you for that. Thank you for the healing that you're going to perform in the lives of these that are on our list. We pray, God, that you would just continue to minister to them and manifest your glory and your presence, your power, in the name of Jesus. These uh, that are part of our uh, local body, God, for Stephanie and Josh and for Amanda and, and, and Amaru and uh, Riley, God, I pray for healing in their body, God, that you would touch them. I know that Joel has been dealing with some sickness, Lord. We pray for healing in his body. And Father, we just believe and trust in that your will is going to be done in each and every life. And, God, we pray that you continue to do that. Help us tonight as we go through your word. I pray, God, that you would speak in our hearts. Help us, Lamb of God, to receive from you and to hear from you the things that you would have to say to us tonight. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory and all the honor. You are worthy of it all. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, Revelation chapter 2. <coughs> Revelation chapter 2. Beginning with the first verse. The Bible says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lap stands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. She went too fast. I'm going to go back to four. That you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the de deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Again, I want to minister tonight on the epistle to Ephesus, dealing with uh, this first letter that was written to the first church of the uh, churches in Asia. And uh, we just believe the Lord to speak to us tonight. You can be seated. Thank you so much. Just some historical remarks about Ephesus, uh, just some background about Ephesus and, and, and to understand uh, what this community was. Uh, we, we know that uh, not only were they addressed here, but also Paul uh, had a lot of dealings with uh, the, the city of Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, uh, and, and, and some great successes that he had there. But Ephesus was once a magnificent and important city. It was nearest to Patmos where John wrote these letters from and, and, and recorded these uh, uh, utterances of Jesus and what Jesus has said, these revelations of who Jesus said he was and what he was telling him. It was the center of trade for a rich and a beautiful country. It was the seat of its government, its learning, its art, its wealth, and its religion. It boasted a great temple to the goddess Diana, which was one of the wonders of the world. And Paul was there again. He was there for two years and experienced very great success. He, as a matter of fact, the, the book to, uh, well, the latter letter to the first letter to Corinthians was written from Ephesus uh, that Paul wrote. And later he sent the epistle entitled Ephesians to this church. And so Ephesus was the home of the Apostle John. He ministered there and, and died there. Some of the ruins of the church still remain today. Mary, the mother of Jesus, probably died there uh, and, and was buried there. John was commanded by Jesus from the cross to take care of his mother. And so Apollos was converted to Christ in Ephesus. Timothy lived here and preached and died a, a victim of mob violence for his protest against the envy uh, of the frenzy of the great festival of Artemis. And so today there's a small Turkish town called Aha, Aha Saluk, which represents the once noted city of Ephesus. So that kind of gives you some idea that it's in that region of Turkey uh, where Ephesus existed in that particular time. The spiritual characteristics of this particular church period uh, that we're dealing with here, this Ephesian church period, was one of warmth and love and labor for Christ. And it dates directly from the apostles in which the defection began by the gradual cooling of the love of some and the false profession of others and the incoming of undue exaltations of the clergy and church offices. And the approximate date of this period was from A.D. 30, uh, which was just after uh, the death of Christ and uh, leading up into uh, the, the first apostles, the first church, up to A.D. 170. Uh, this church was, uh, of this period was near perfection than, than, than those of any of the periods that were to follow. They, they were coming right out of the teachings of Jesus and the, and the time and the period of Jesus being here. They had their early church fathers which had hands-on experience with Jesus to be able to minister in these churches and speak the revelations that God had given unto them. And so in, in, in this particular time, in this particular uh, period of time through the Ephesian church, we, we see the, a, a great 
growth of the church. Uh, matter of fact, the scripture even declared that in this early time that God was adding to the church daily that should, should be saved. And so there was a lot of, of, of great growth that took place uh, in this time. The historical facts of Christ's death, his resurrection, and ascension, they were still fresh in the minds of these saints. And this church was welded together by divine love. They sold their earthly possessions. And they lived as one family. So we see in the early church how that they were a, a great example of what we should be today, how that they cared for one another, intended to one another, even to the point that we saw again in, in, in the latter part of, uh, of the book of Acts or the early part of the book of Acts where we see that they, uh, they, they, they went and sold everything that they had and put it in, laid it at the apostles' feet and said, you know, do with it what you need to do. And so there, there was a great love and a great admiration and a great divine move of God that took place under this particular church. And so uh, as we look at this, you know, understand not only regionally where they were, not only historically where they were, but spiritually where they were as they're being addressed here by Jesus. And so as we kind of outline this particular seven verses of this letter, I want to break it down this way. Number one, the description of Christ in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. As he appeared to this church, the Bible said that he held the seven stars or the ministers in his right hand and he walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which we described as the churches. And so Jesus is saying here, I, I, I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm with you, I'm, I'm, I'm holding your ministers, I'm, I'm holding it all together, I'm, I'm making sure everything's working the way that it needs to work. And I'm, I'm in the midst of the church, I'm, I'm with you, I made you a promise that I'll never leave you, I made you a promise that I'll never forsake you, but I'll go with you even to the end of the earth. So he's making this proclamation to him. Listen, I want you to know the one that's speaking to you right now is the one that is with you. I'm going to walk through the storms with you. I'm going to be with you in the trials. I'm going to help you through all the circumstances that you're going to have to face. And I'm going to be very evident with my presence in the midst of you. I'm holding the ministers of God in my hand, the angels, the stars. I'm holding them in the midst of my hand. And I'm walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And so Jesus describes himself to the church at Ephesus in this way. Number two, he begins to commend this church in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. He said, I know your works. I know your labor. I know your patience. That you cannot bear those who are evil. And that you've tested those who say they're apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Now, now check this out. So, so here Jesus is. He's talking to this church at Ephesus and he's beginning to commend them. He's letting them know, listen, I've watched you. I've seen how good you've done. I've seen when, when people have come in with heresies. I've seen how people have come in with false teachings how you've withstood against them, how you've persevered in the midst of tribulation, how, how you've worked through all these things. I've watched you go through this, your works, your labors, your patience. All these things are known, and you have not become weary, or you have not fainted. He said you cannot bear them which are evil. You've tried, tried the professing apostles who are not really apostles, and you found them to be liars. The true love of God in this church enabled them to be what they were. The love of God is a bond of perfection. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. The Bible said, but above, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. The identifying mark of the church. Jesus said, by this shall they know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. This church had love. This church loved one another. This church period of people, they were willing to do whatever Whatever they had to do, whatever sacrifices they had to make, they were willing to do it in order to be what God had called them to be. Because you got to remember this. There was a great anticipation that Jesus was soon coming back. Matter of fact, the early apostles stood as Jesus ascended into the heavens. They stood there looking up into the stars, waiting on him to return at any moment. And the Bible said that the, that the angel came down and said, You men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing at the stars? For this same Jesus, as you've seen him go, shall return again in like manner. But the, 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 the anticipation that they were about to be redeemed, the anticipation that they were about to be taken out of that sin-cursed world, the anticipation that Jesus would return and establish your kingdom, Kingdom, they knew that if they were going to walk, they had to walk in love, this bond of perfection. And so Jesus acknowledges. He says to them, listen, I see what you're doing. I see what you've gone through. I've seen how you've made it. I see how you've done good. And everything's being held together for you. But then he goes to a rebuke in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. He said, nevertheless, I have this against you that you've left your first love. Could you imagine? Being 
read this letter, and, and you know, you're just kind of standing there, and, and, and you're hearing the words of Jesus. And Jesus said, you're doing good. You're taking care of false prophets. You're taking care of false apostles. You're taking care of heresies and false doctrines. You're, you're, you're in love with one another. You're being everything that you need to be for each other. But you've left your first love. Could it be possible that we could get so caught up in doing church that we forget what it is to be church? Could it be that Ephesus had got so caught up in the routine of doing what they did that they forgot that not many years before that there was a man named Jesus that hung on a cross and died? Could it be that that time had passed so quickly that their minds had become calloused to what their Savior had endured not many years before that? If they could suffer that quickly, how much more so after thousands of years of being removed from the cross could this church, the church, not this church, but the church, become so calloused and ingrained in routine and ritual and tradition and going through the motions that, that we could forget our first love. This is, this is what he's trying to get them to understand. Listen, this is a rebuke of this church. That, that, that he said, I've got this serious charge against you. You've left your first love. And listen, this is around AD 100 when this was being wrote. And the church had already slipped from the love of the early ap apostolic age. That soon removed, and they'd already slipped into just doing it, just going through the motions. Not, not really worshiping because they love him. Not really going through the giving and attendance and stuff because they love him. But, but just doing it because that's what they've come to know to do. They left their first love. I... I I know it's none of y'all in here tonight, okay? But, but I just wonder how many people within the church have lost sight of the day that Jesus came in and washed their sins away. I wonder how many people have forgotten the day that Jesus healed their body or delivered them from the bondage or the addiction. That people have gotten so far removed and so comfortable and, and as the scripture said, at ease in Zion that we've forgotten how good he's been to us. And all of a sudden, we kind of put it on autopilot and we're just kind of waiting for the, the trumpet to sound. Are you with me? See, the Bible said, they that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. In other words, I, I can't just put it on autopilot and, and, and stay in the way waiting on Jesus to come. There's a fight to be fought and a fight to be won. There's a glory to be revealed. There's an anointing to walk in. There's a power that God wants to render unto us. And the only way that we can walk in that purely is to remember from whence we came and who's the one that brought us to this place and walk in the power humbly under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt us in due time. So as you begin to look at this and understand, they're in love with one another. He's encouraging them about their bond of love with one another. But he said, you forgot your first love. It's not enough for me to say to Nancy, I love you, my sister. It's, it's not enough for me to say, Brother Jim, I, I love you, my brother. Thank, thank, thank God for you. But, but if I can't, if I can demonstrate love to them, and I can't demonstrate love for him, then this love is sounding brass, tinkling cymbals clattering and clamoring and carrying on because if I don't have love for him none of this really matters and so what he's trying to get us to see is he said I've got this against you you've left your first love and so he begins to lay it out for him he says listen I, I want you to understand the warning that I'm about to give you Revelation chapter 2 5 and 6 he said remember therefore from where you've fallen Remember what I brought you out of. Remember, it was me. 
that reached down in the horrible pit and caught you up and set your feet on a rock. It was me that went to the trenches of hell to fight for you. It was me that laid down my life and shed my blood on the cross. It was me that called you out of darkness into my marvelous life. It was me. Remember from where you've fallen. I get around, and I know this is probably a, an oxymoron because you can't really be one and be the other, but I get around what I like to call arrogant Christians. It is. There's an arrogance about them. Like, they, they, they've forgotten that it wasn't them that got them where they were. You, you know what I'm saying? It's almost this air about them that they, they feel like they arrived there by themselves. You know, almost to the point that they, they, they were popped out of mama's womb, sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? I, I know y'all don't know nobody like that. But I've been around a few. Just come to camp meet me one time. I, just, I shouldn't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. He said, remember from where you've fallen. All he's doing is trying to jar their memory. And this is what we do a lot of times in church. We're just trying to draw your memory to make you appreciative how far you come and be reminded that it's he that brought you from there. You know, we, we, we come together, and if there's nothing else that provo should provoke worship in the house of God is when you remember from where you've fallen. Nothing else should provoke you to more than say, okay, God, I'll run around the sanctuary if nobody else will run. I'll run because, God, I remember where you brought me from. I remember, listen, in Paula's case, I remember just months ago I was sitting there trying to put words together, barely able to hold myself up, but, God, you brought me through. I remember, God, and if you tell me to run, I'll run. If you tell me to worship, I'll worship, God, because I remember where you brought me from. See, I remember and I can stand here the rest of the night and tell you all the good things God's done in my life and what he's brought me through. I remember. I remember from where I've fallen. And he's saying, listen, because you've grown so cold that you've gotten away from your first love, you need to repent and start all over again. Go back and do your first works. Listen, you need to go back and recapture what you lost is basically what he's trying to do. You, you need to go back and be reminded of the day of grace in your life. You need to go back and be reminded that, that it wasn't just that moment where you knelt down and asked me to forgive you of your sins, but it was a, from that moment forward that I began to plot your life and I began to plan your works and I began to do works in your life and do all the things that I was doing for you. It was me that was guiding your steps. It was me that was walking you through the storm. It was me that was guiding you through the trial. It was me that was protecting you from the enemy. If the devil had his way, to kill you. But you got to go back and remember that it was me that brought you through. He said, repent and do your first works. So, so he, he, he's, he's rebuking them. He's warning them. And he said to them again, remember from where you've fallen. Remember the first love you had and how that, that love was exemplified in perfect works before God and man. You, listen, just draw your minute, memory for just a moment. Some of you might have to go back years some of you might just have to go back months or even weeks. But can you remember the day Jesus saved you and the excitement that you had? Just couldn't wait to tell people how good God's been to you. You Listen, you, didn't, you, you, couldn't care, you could have cared less if there were a thousand people in the sanctuary or ten people in the sanctuary. What you felt wasn't based on numerical persuasion of people that were there. What you felt was that God met you at a place of repentance and He touched your heart and saved your soul and forgave your sin and you felt whole, you felt peace, you felt joy, you were exuberant. My fear is that a great percentage of the church has forgotten that day. They've forgotten. They've forgotten what God did. You say, how can you make such an accusation, Pastor? Because Listen, I, I go to a lot of churches and, and there's a lot of people that don't look happy. They don't look joyous. They don't like to celebrate. They don't find the good things to worship about. Yeah, maybe I've had a bad day, but I'm telling you, God's still good. 
Maybe I've gone through a heartache. Maybe I've had to deal with some pain. Maybe I've had to go through some suffering. But when I stand in the presence of God, I recognize that the sufferings of this present day are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I'm telling you, friend, when you begin to understand that it's God that brought you through the trial. It's God that saved you from the sin. It's God that healed your body. It's God that put you in your right mind. When you begin to think about that, something ought to stir up inside of you. It says, I can remember and go back to the great of who God was. I, I, I'm trying to remember the, the, the singer that, that wrote this song. He passed away not too long ago. Uh, African American gentleman. But, it, but, it, but the song says, take me back. Take me back to where I first met you. Take me back to where I first began, God. And all it was saying was, man, Sometimes I get so cold. Sometimes I get so callous. The world beats on me. Stuff begins to happen in my life. I, I, I go through trials and I get hardened. And, and people, I, I begin to distrust people. And I begin to see people falling away. And it begins to cause me to become harder and become harder. And he's saying, Lord, if you just take me back. Take me to the place where I laugh. Take me back to the place where I rejoice. Take me back to the place where I wasn't worried about the beat of the song or who the preacher was. I just wanted to get in your presence and worship you. God, take Take me back to that place. He said, repent and do the first words. Go back to where I brought you from. Return to this original state of pure love and good works. He said, listen, if you don't, I'm going to come quickly and I'm going to remove your candlestick out of its place. Remember what these, can these, these lampstands, these candlesticks, remember what they represent? The, the church. They represent the church. He said, I, if, if, listen, he, he said, church, if you don't get it right, I'm going to remove you out of your place. That's scary, folks. I, I, I know, listen, I know there's a lot of false teaching out there that once you in, you in. But you go through these seven epistles to these different churches and all through them, Jesus is giving admonition after admonition. Get it right, I'll take you out. Get it right, I'll take your name out of the book. Get it right, or I'll take your church out. I, listen, I, I, and I believe that what Jesus is trying to convey to us is the severity of the moment. He's understanding when these words begin to come into revelation and people begin to understand the day and hour that they live in here, they ain't got time to play no games. They ain't got time to be, you know, just messing around. It ain't no time to be trying to go through some religious uh, 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 oracles and doing stuff this way. I need you to get back to that love. I need to get back to what drove you to go witness. I need you to get back to what drove you to evangelize. I need you to get back to what you, when you got to tell people about me and you weren't ashamed of the gospel. I need you to get back to that place where you ain't putting on your religious cloak and just coming to the church and acting all holy. But then when you go out in the world, you're trying to be a chameleon in the world. I need you to fall in love with me all over again. I'm telling you something, folks. And I know I harp on it a lot, but I'm telling you, you'll never convince me that you're living a life on fire for him out there. When you can't even worship him in a place of safety like this, you'll never convince me that people that come and sit in here that are hard-hearted, that, 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 that just lock down and they won't even rejoice in God's presence, you'll never tell me they're being an effective witness out there. And how, how dare we even think that we'll stand before him one day and hear a well done when we can't even worship him in his own house. Something's wrong, folks. He said, listen, I'll remove your lampstand. Do Okay, let's look at this from two scenarios. So does he literally abolish the church as it stands for that vicinity? Or could it be that he just says, you know what, I'm withdrawing. And I'm a, you, you, you'll be nothing more than a social club because my presence will not always strive with man. Are you with me? Folks, I would quit today if I didn't feel the anointing. I didn't come in here to be a cheerleader. I didn't come here to go through the hoorah motions. I'll go to driving trucks full time if I don't feel the anointing. I got to know that God is real. I got to know that what I'm doing is having purpose. I got to know that what the church is trying to do has an effect. I got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. That, and listen, if it's not having an effect, we got to be bold enough to go before the presence of God and say, God, some way, somehow, if we got to ax this because it's bringing an indictment on the church, then God, we do what we got to do because more than anything, we want your glory to go forward. God, we don't want to fall into the trap of just motions and doing what we do because we say we're going to do it. Are you with me? He said, listen, if you, if you don't get back, if 
you don't get back to what really matters, it's almost like going back to the basics. If you don't get back to what really matters, I'm not going to play these games with you. You know, I remember when, when the Lord was dealing with me about giving my heart back to Him. I was 19 years old. I was living foolishly, doing things I shouldn't have been doing. I was calling up stuff I shouldn't have been doing. And you've heard this story. I was up in New Jersey and uh, was at an auction and was walking through a field and opening up the Bible. And when I opened up the Bible, it fell to Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And it talks about them not, not, not retaining God in their knowledge and doing that which was convenient to sight, and God gave them up to a reprobate mind. And I, I looked at that verse, and just as clear as you hear me speaking now, I heard the Lord speak to me and said, Son, I'm not playing any more games with you. I'm not playing any more games with you. I, I grew up in this thing. I've been in this thing all my life. I knew the calling that was on my life. And I was running as hard as I could. And God, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a clarion call to me. Son, you ain't got no more time to play games. Now, we're 25 years after that. But remember, a day to God is a thousand years, a thousand years a day. He was saying to me at that time, either you come back to me and live for me, or I'm removing the call. I'm removing what I put. The, I'm removing You got to come back to me. There's a lot of people deceived. that think because their name's on a piece of paper in a church roll membership somewhere. That they're going to make it to heaven. There's a lot of people that are deceived and believing that because they put their name on a tithe roll that they're going to make it to heaven. There's going to be a lot of people deceived that think because they warm a seat on a Sunday morning that they're going to make it to heaven. But they've missed it. They missed what God's looking for. Remember what he's returning for. He said, when I return, shall I find faith on the earth? He said, when I return, I, he, he said, I, wanna, I want the church to be without spot without wrinkle, without blemish. He said that I might present it to her a glorious church. A glorious church. A glorious church. So what you're looking for when you return, no spot, no wrinkle, no blemish, you want it to be a glorious church. Folks, let's just look around us for just a moment. Anything glorious about this? Scary. Very scary to me as a pastor, as a minister. Very scary to me. Because there's a lot of people that have just went through religious calisthenics. They've done what they need to do. And they're missing that he's looking for somebody who just loves him, wants to be in relationship with him. If I can go back to Sunday for just a moment. There's a lot of people that are living with toxic religion. They're, they're toxic. And, 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 their, and their toxicity is, is dispelled on other people. Because it just, you know, even Jesus warned the Pharisees, listen, you'll, you'll find one, make a convert, and you'll make him more fit for hell than yourself. Remember, remember I shared that scripture with you, and, and, and literally what Jesus said, that person is better off lost than they are to buy into your religious toxicity. It, it's, it's better they would make, that they would remain lost because then they'd have a chance somewhere along the line to repent rather than being deceived and lied. Manipulated to think that they're okay. And Jesus is saying in this first church, now think, folks, there's six more churches he's about to address. And the very first one, he's hitting them right between the eyes. He said, listen, I I've seen the good, but let's deal with the bad. Because if you're going to be effective for me, if you're going to be what I've called you to be, you got to understand that this is the place that you've got to come to. The, the church, <laughs> the church would become useless if it degenerated to the place where its activities were motivated by anything except love for God and lost men. If we don't do what we do because we love the lost, if we don't do what we do because we love God, we're wasting our time. If all we're coming together for is to get our feel and, 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 and to go through what we want to go, if that's all we're doing and the only reason why we're doing it, we're missing it. If there's not a love for people who are lost. If there's not a love for God who wants to save. And we're missing it. We're missing it. So, so as often as these groups became great numbers and increased with goods and, they, and, and lost their first love, God would choose a lesser, humble, consecrated group to serve as his candlestick. I read a very interesting quote this past week. And you may agree or disagree with this. He said, but in the quote, and it was a lady that put the quote out. She said, I just wish for once 
that a mega church pastor would come out and say the word for the year is repentance. I, I read that and I was like, wow. Because, you know, you've heard me say it before. You know, when prophecies come, you never hear rebuke. It's always how good things are going to get. You know, with, with all these people that are coming out, this is the year of the Lord. My, my wife and I were riding down the road today, and, 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 and uh, we was listening to the radio, and it was a commercial for Joel Osteen, and he said, this is the year that the Lord is going to work. I said, well, man, I thought he worked last year too. Isn't it amazing how, how that, this is the year that God's going to work? Well, I thought he did a pretty good job in 17, and I'm still here. And it's only by him, so he was working. You know, this is the year of increase. Every year is a year of increase. That's what they tell you. I mean, you, you go back. All you got to do is go back and play the tape. I mean, every year, this is going to be a greater year than last year. I hope so. You know, but for once, would, would, you know, what if somebody just come up and say, folks, last year was great, but this year right here, y'all better fester up and pull things together because it's going to be terrible. Everything's going downhill from here. That's what Scripture says. Scripture teaches that in the last days there will be perilous times. It didn't say prosperous, it said perilous. That there will be scoffers, men who were lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, haters and evildoers and people that were disobedient, to I mean unthankful, unholy. All these things that are listed that will be occurring in the last day. And we got... People with millions of viewers saying, it's going to be a great year. The Lord's going to work this year. He's been working since in the beginning, God. You know, and people buy it, they drink it like it's Kool-Aid. Woo, I got to send him $10 because he said this is going to be my year. Hallelujah. I'll tell you it's going to be your year. Send me $10. And I'll believe it with you. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. That, that, that people buy in to this stuff. So, so is, even with this year, it's been the same way in the history of the church. In the midst of his warnings to the church, Christ mentions to them that he knows that they hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which God also hates. Uh, uh, it's verse 6. He said, but this you have, the Nicolaitans. I hate what they do, and you hate what they do. So what's this all about? The word Nicolaitans comes from the Greek words nikaio, which means to conquer, to overcome, to prevail, or to come off superior. Uh, the, the middle word is laos, which means a people, a nation, a multitude, or it can mean laity. So if the word is symbolic, it refers to the earliest form of the notion of a priestly order or clergy, which later, which later divided into equal brotherhood. Matthew 23, verse 8. <laughs> he said, but you do not be called... Do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. You know, I, I, I was walking through the hallway the other day, and somebody, somebody that was uh, one of the new people that had come Sunday walked by me and said, Pastor Williams, we really, I said, don't do that. Please don't do that. First of all, Mr. Williams is my daddy. <laughs> and, and I appreciate your reverence, man. But I, I, listen, I, people have asked me, you know, you're an ordained bishop. Why don't you don't have people call you bishop? I, I'm not into all that. And this is what Jesus is telling them. Don't you get hung up in hierarchy. Don't you get hung up in prestige. Don't you get hung up in titles. There's one teacher. He's the Christ. You know, my daddy used to set me straight a long time ago. I'd pick on him and call him father. He said, boy, you ain't got but one father. And I'm not him. I'm your daddy. You know, so, so we, and even the scripture teaches that. Call no man father. Because you have one father who is God. You know, so, so we, we, we see all this and understand that, that Jesus is warning them that they're, they're, they're taking the brotherhood and they're dividing up in the priest and laity. And what in Ephesus was deeds, Revelation 2 and 6, what was deeds had become in Pergamos a doctrine. Revelation 2 and 15, look. He said you hate the deeds, but now look at this. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Look how. And just from one church to the next, that, there was a progression that what was once deeds has now turned into doctrine. I need about an hour right there. Because what, what people try to weasel in to be acceptable here, 
But it comes to this generation, people are ready to die for it. Because it becomes doctrine. Let that sink in just a moment. You see, you look at our, we're all, Scripture said the days of a man are three score and ten. If you're younger than 35, hang tight with me just a moment. But if you're older than 35, scripturally, you're on the downhill slide. Are you with me? Think about in your lifetime. Go to your early years. Let's just use TV. What you never saw on TV. And now what's widely accepted on public television. Are you with me? Go watch the Andy Griffith show. And then go watch whatever. You pick a show. Are you with me? What was deeds had turned into doctrine. What was deeds, what somebody, what the enemy used and lured people with had now become lifestyle, acceptable. In the 50s and 60s, nobody would have dared say, I'm homosexual. Now they shout it from the housetop and they're proud about it. And now the media and television and Hollywood are behind it and pushed it as doctrine to now that is accepted in the majority of the country that a man can marry a man and a woman can marry a woman. You never heard that 10, 15, 20 years ago. Because 10, 15, 20 years ago, they just began to push it as a deed. Now it's doctrine. Scary, folks. What happened? The church left its first love. The church refused to go back to the original place of remembering from where they've fallen. The church had gotten to the place that they, they so long to look good in the eyes of men that anything became acceptable just to get a crowd. Are you with me? Man, this. Can I take you to an Ecclesiastes scripture? The things which have been shall also be. So the things that we read in Scripture that the first churches were dealing with, we're seeing them in a multiplied progression today to the point that what once was preached against has now become acceptable in doctrine in a lot of churches. Sin. People have become comfortable in sin to the point that they buy into the false prophets that stand up and declare this is a good year rather than somebody that's really got a heart for God and says repent. Call on God while there's time because night's coming when you're not going to have that time. See, God's looking for people that I say, you know what? I'm not looking for you and your frivolities. I'm not looking for you to try to paint rosy pictures of people. I want people to call on my name. I want to pour my spirit out on all flesh and all that call on the name of the Lord be saved. That's what I want. And I've got my ministers. I've got my true ministers in my hand. And I'm walking amongst the true church. And I'm trying to call you back to a place of repentance so that you again can one time have the power that you once had. Listen, folks, listen, let's just be real honest with ourselves. We don't see what we used to see and we definitely don't see what the first churches saw. And we want to blame everything and anything, and we want to explain it away. But the fact is, we've left our first love. We've left our first love. I'm saying we. I'm throwing myself in the group. You know, I, I, I've asked God some hard questions, especially going into this new year. God, what, what do we need to do? What's, what do what, what you want me to do at Daystar? God, hey, how you want me to lead this flock? What, what do we need to look at? What do we need to change? What do we need to do away with, God? What's, what's hurting us? What's hindering us? Because I'll be honest with you, in 12 years, we are not what we were. You know, people looked at Paula like she was strange when she was running around here. But it used to be a regular occurrence that somebody would take off in the Holy Ghost. People looking at her like, what's she doing? Don't you know we don't do that anymore? We got a big building now. We're pretty. We got nice chairs, and cameras, and 
we got lights, man. Look, we, we don't do that. What's wrong with us? You know, I, the one thing I keep hearing from the Lord is get back to the basics, son. Just get back to the basics. Get back to what you know is right and build on that foundation. No, don't, don't, don't get caught up in all the hype. Don't get caught up in the latest fast. Don't get caught. Listen, just get back to my word. Get back to my promises. Believe me. Trust me. Walk by faith, not by sight. And watch what I'm able to do. Because we're not careful. Things that we once stood against will become acceptable as doctrine in our lives. I've seen it, folks. I've seen it in the church. I've seen it in the church of God. I, I've seen it in my home church. I've seen people that at one time, man, they, they stood before the church and they made declarations, they made vows, of things that they would adhere to. And as society changed, they changed. And my God tells me it's better not to make a vow than to make one and break it. And they made a vow that we would adhere and live certain ways. That's why I don't promote joining the church. That's one reason. Because people don't, that's why I hate doing weddings. I've turned down more in the last few weeks. Got a good friend of mine is getting ready to get married. He, he told me today, he, on the phone, he said, I, I ain't say nothing to you about it because I know how you feel about marriages. I said, I, I feel good about marriages. It's weddings I got a problem with. Because people stand up and make all these vows and, you know, they, 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 they could care less. They don't even realize that they're making a vow before God, a consecrated union. People stand up before the church. They're making a consecrated vow before God. I'm going to adhere to this. I'm going to live by this. I'm, I'm going to walk in these principles. I'm going to adhere to the Word of God. And then you never see them again. I've had people literally, and some of you remember this. You've been with me for a while. I've had people literally stand in the altar, give their heart to the Lord, and jump up and say, I want to join this church. I said, well, let, let's see how good you do. I ain't seen them since. It's the truth. Standing in the altar, I want to join this church. God's done a work in my life, and I'm ready to join this church. I said, we'll talk about that. Never come back. Never come back. You see, not only do they have a responsibility when they take a vow, I got a responsibility because I've made a vow to the church of God that I'm going to hold people accountable to those teachings. So if there's things in people's lives that I already know that they're violating the teachings, the doctrines of the church, no way am I going to say, come on in. Whether I agree with them or not, that ain't got nothing to do with it. I made a vow that I would not violate my ordinance being ordained by the church to bring people in that are adhering to the teachings. Why? Because if I start getting on that slippery slope, who's not to say that homosexual is going to come here and say, well, you... You know, and I've had them tell me, you won't let me in because I smoke, but you'll let that one in, and he's gluttonous. They start pointing fingers. You won't let me in because I do this action, but you'll, you'll let them in, and they're they doing this. You know, I, and I'm sitting there going, at some point, you got to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm done with this. I get asked every month how many people have joined your church. Every month I have to give a report. How many people join your church? It's always zero. No new members here. New people coming, but not new members in the church of God. I love the church of God, folks. I've been in this thing all my life. I, you know, unless God does something different, I'll be in it till I die. But I can tell you this, I'm not going to violate my vow and just bring anybody in because you're not joining this local church. And I don't know why I'm telling you this right now, but you're not joining this local church. You're joining a denomination, which I have an obligation to. And I've had people get mad and leave because I wouldn't sign them up because they wanted to join the club. It's a vow before God. And he said, listen, if you start allowing these deeds to slip in, what becomes acceptable will become doctrine. And it will become lifestyle. And if you, listen, and once it becomes doctrine or lifestyle, God help you if you get revelation of truth and you try to come against it. Because then you know what they'll do? They'll kill you. Just like they did Jesus. Because what was deeds in the Old Testament, somewhere in that intertestament period it became doctrine to the point that they said, 
This man, according to our law, ought to die. He was the son of God. Help us, Jesus. So, let, 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 let's, let's finish this up. His promise, though, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. He said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Let me just tell you this right here. God will never give revelation that is in contradiction to his word. Let me say that again because I've had to say it over the last several months, several times, which a lot of people have not accepted. But God will never, ever give revelation that contradicts his word. He's not going to tell you to do something in revelation, in a, in a dream or a word or a prophecy. He'll never tell you to do anything that he's already told you to do in his word that is contrary to that. Are you with me? If you get a dream, if you get a word from the Lord, take it back to the book. And if it doesn't line up, throw it away as you ate bad pizza. Are you with me? I, I'm telling you that there are people, he said, he who has an ear. Everybody do this. Everybody's got an ear. All right, good. Everybody's got ears. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Not what pastors are saying. Not what televangelists are saying. Not what ministries are saying. Hear what God is saying to his church. My church, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hear what the Spirit is saying. And he gives this commendation. He said, to every man. And every woman who seek divine truth, this is the promise that's given. To him that overcometh, I'll give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Listen, if you'll find truth, if you'll seek truth, if you'll go back to your first love, if you'll repent and do the first works again, if you'll do whatever you got to do to get yourself right with God, God said, if you'll overcome, I'm going to give you to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So guess what that means? That means I get to go to heaven. And I get to enjoy heaven for all of eternity if I can just overcome. So if the, if the reward is if you overcome, this is what you get. Then what's the judgment if you don't overcome? Because if Jesus is clear enough to say to him who overcomes I'm thankful that he didn't say to him who shows up on Sunday to him who puts some money in the plate to him who, who shows up in the, in, the, in the Bible study class he said to him who overcomes now listen to overcome means there's got to be something that's contentious that doesn't mean you're not going to fight that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. That doesn't mean you're just going to tiptoe your way into heaven. I'm telling you, the devil's going to fight you with everything he can to stop you because he knows he's banned from that place for eternity and he'll never be able to be, be able to live there again. He was cast down like lightning, Jesus said. He'll never be able to, and he doesn't want you to go there. If he can't have it, he don't want you to have it. He'll kill you. He'll destroy you. He'll manipulate. He'll do whatever he can. But Jesus said, if you overcome, I'm going to give you the opportunity to eat from the tree of life which is going to be in the midst of the paradise of God. You say, preacher, when you break it down that way, it sounds pretty simple. It's not. It's a fight. He's cunning. He's crafty. He's wise. He knows what he's doing. If you sit here for a moment and think, man, I got this thing licked, I'm telling you, he will hit you from an angle tomorrow that you never, ever expected. I'm not trying to bring up anybody's past. I'm not trying to deal with anybody's junk. I'm, I, I'm just going to tell you this truth. Some of you may remember this. How many of you, uh, when we first bought this building or were thinking of buying this building, did anybody here go with me to Greenville, South Carolina to look at the church that's there? I remember Brother day. Okay. We went down to look at that, that facility that was a plant that they, they converted. Okay. Remember the prayer meeting we had at the end? A prophetic word came, and, and this is what the word was. The Lord says that you will face spiritual adversity in a way you've never faced it before. But he wants you to be reminded he's going to be with you to overcome the press through. This is what I did. Paul, this is what I did. I heard that word, and I said, you know what, man? I fought spiritual battles before I can handle this. 
I'll be all right here. I can handle this. I'll be good. I, man, stuff I've come through, God's brought me through, this will be a piece of cake. I'm going to tell you something. Something hit me from left field. That it was just recently that I finally found the victory over. And I thought, man, eh, spiritual battles, man, I'll go through some depression. I'll probably fight some battles, but I'll get through it. I'm telling you, something hit me like I never thought was going to hit me in my life. To the point, it made me almost want to quit and buckle my knees. Hit me. The devil wants to kill you, folks. The devil wants to destroy you. And he will use whatever he's got to use to manipulate, to hinder, to hold up, to kill, to destroy. Whatever he's got to do, he'll do it. But if you overcome, there's a blessing. If you press through the adversity, there's a blessing. I'm not trying to put you out there. But Stacy, I told you, keep hanging on. Keep hanging on. And my man is sitting here today. The devil tried to kill you, didn't he, brother? And you're sitting here tonight. God saw you through. I'm telling you. All I can do, listen, when you get in the battle, I can't go find it for you. All I can do is be your cheerleader and say, come on, you can make it. I've been through this. I've seen God do it. I know God can get you through. Keep on coming. Keep on pressing. Don't give up. Don't back down now. Keep on coming. Listen, that's all I know to do. That's all I know to do. And along the way, you shared it with me, God begins to give confirmation. I'm still here, son. I still love you. I got you. I ain't gave up on you. Am I right? Am I right? Listen, I'm telling you, God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. And again, I'm not trying to air dirty laundry. I'm just trying to put the devil on notice. We know what you're up to. And we know greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And if I can just keep pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus, I know that victory is going to be mine. Is it easy? No. But to him that overcomes Get through that fight. You might be up against something right now. I got a, I got a guy that works for me. He called me today. He said, he said, I know God's up to something. I'm not sure what it is. But I, he said, I was so glad to see 2017 get going. And the second day of the year, he hit me with something else. I don't know what in the world's going on. I don't know what God's trying to tell me. I told him, I said, brother, just keep hanging on. That's all I can tell you to do. Keep on praying. Keep on believing. Keep hanging on. You can make it if you'll just keep hanging on. That's all I know. That's what we got to do in this last day. We got to keep encouraging people. And when nobody else is there to encourage you, you better stand up and encourage yourself and remind yourself from where God brought you from. Remember from where you've fallen. Remember that it was God that brought you through. If nobody else is going to tell you how good God's been, you just go ahead and testify for yourself and say, my God's been good to me. He saw me through a mighty long way and He's going to keep me to the end. Just like He promised. 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 Just like, man, I'm telling you, God will do what he said he would do. The scripture says in Hebrew, he which is promised is faithful. He's faithful. So I don't care what the battle is. Press on. I don't care how hot they turn the fire up. Walk around in it. And watch the only thing be burned off of the things that restrain you. My God, I'm telling you, God show up the fourth man in the fire. He'll walk with you. He'll be with you. He'll lay with you in the lion's den. My God, I'll be with you. Keep pressing on. It's a fight, but it's worth fighting. Because you're not in it alone. Hear me, somebody, tonight. You're not in this thing alone. There's days you've looked around and all the friends have forsaken you. Those days you looked around and all the people that you thought were close and be there for you have walked away. But I promise you, according to the word of the Lord, you are not alone. God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God said, I am with you. You are not alone. God is there for you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? Be courageous. Be strong. Fight. Because if you'll overcome, He's faithful. He's going to bring past what he promised. Amen. Do you love the Lord? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your encouraging word tonight. Thank you for your rebuke. God, to touch our hearts, challenge our hearts, to get back to what you called us to be, to, to live our lives in a way that brings glory and honor to you, to get back to the simplicity of serving you and loving you and loving one another. 
God, we, we, we complicate things because we're trying to, trying to make it uh, attractional. God, we were never called to be attractional. We were always called to be missional. God, we've got to have a purpose. We've got to pursue after it like we've never pursued after it before. God, that's to reach the lost. And Lord, I vow today that they won't come to us. We'll go to them. We'll do what we got to do, Lord. We'll go into all the world and preach this gospel. Because, God, people are dying and going to hell. Lord, we got to do what we can do while it's yet day for night to come and no man can work. Father, if there's people here tonight that have lost their passion, lost their burden, they feel like they have no hope, they feel like they've given up, I ask you tonight to help them to go back and repent and do the first works again. God, to call on your name and remember their first love. God, it ain't who they love first, it's who first loved us. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, you commended your love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You loved us first. God, help us to go back to the one who first loved us. To live our lives in a way that brings glory and honor to you, that we're obedient to your commands, obedient to your word. We're not getting caught up in the hype. We're not getting caught up in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, the perilousness of the times. God, we're just looking to you, the author, the finisher of our faith. I thank you for this tonight, God. It's encouraged me. You spoke to me, God. Thank you, Lord. I praise your name for this tonight. And all of God's people said, amen. Take a moment. Love on one another. Fellowship with one another. God bless you. I love you so much.